She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Uh, for the past couple of days I've been watching Princess Diana documentaries, I'm not sure why, I just had an inkling to, probably because I've been watching The Crown, <laughs> there it is. But it's been making me sad and a little depressed and then sitting down today to record this video, there's going to be a lot of emotions here. It's a, it's a very sad case or two sad cases. And I just want to prepare you and, you know, prepare you also for, for my potential reactions, although I'm going to try to keep myself um, emotionally in check. But whenever there's cases that have to do with kids, I do get, you know, a little upset. So today we're talking about two cases that happened this year that resemble each other. Um, they have a lot in common and they are both tough to listen to. They are sad. And once you've heard the stories about the five children in these two cases, you'll have a hard time forgetting them. These kids will stay with you as they should. However, I do think it's important. It's important to have this discussion and having it out in the open here on this channel instead of sort of pushing this reality away into some dark closet so we don't have to examine this very real issue. It's unproductive, so we need to talk about it. Talking about it is the only way. Asking what could have been done differently or what could somebody have done differently is really the only way because with the information and the knowledge of what we can look for and how we can help people in our own lives, I think we can actually make a difference. And in the end, that is the most important thing. And it should override our, our initial and understandable discomfort. Before we dive in, however, let's have a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor today is Vessi. Vessi is a new sponsor. But after wearing their shoes for the past couple of months... I could not be happier to have them as a sponsor and tell you all about them. I live, if you don't know, in Rochester, New York, and from October, like mid-October till mid-May, it's either raining, snowing, or a combination of both, but it's definitely freezing. And I get sick of wearing big, clunky snow boots or rain boots anytime I want to go outside for half of the year. But if I even venture out in like normal sneakers or my Uggs, I come home with freezing wet feet. And I think we can all agree there's nothing worse than wet, cold feet. What makes Vessi unique is that their shoes are 100% waterproof, sandproof, slush proof, and slip proof. So they keep your feet totally dry. When I heard that claim, I said, there's no way, because I see these shoes, they look fashionable, they're cute, they are lightweight, and I said, there's no way that these shoes will keep my feet dry, will keep my feet warm, will prevent me from slipping outside, there's no way. But they actually do. With Vessi, the great thing is you don't have to choose function over form because they're also incredibly stylish and they look cute with multiple different outfits and they are very comfortable. They're made with a Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit material that keeps your little piggies cool in the summer and cozy in the winter. And although this material is waterproof, it doesn't feel or look waterproof. The shoes look like any other stylish everyday sneaker and most importantly, they are sustainably made due to the knitting process which leads to less material waste and they are 100% vegan and cruelty free. I wear my Vessies everywhere now to bring Aiden to the bus stop in the morning to run out to the store on our weekend wilderness walks and whenever Bella feels like jumping up and down in muddy puddles and the best part is I can join her in jumping in those muddy puddles because Vessies are super easy to clean. You can rinse them with water and since they're waterproof you can put them back on right away or you can toss them in the washing machine. The potential for these shoes is endless and I can't wait to wear them out and about once the world opens back up. Beach vacation 
conditions will be made better when there's no sand stuck in my shoes. Outdoor concerts will be made more comfortable without my feet getting all sweaty and soggy. There are so many adventures I want to embark on, and my Vessi sneakers will be coming with me. Now all I have to do is get a pair for my husband, who was really jealous a couple weekends ago while we were walking, and and then it started raining. And I was frolicking around like a little dry-footed fairy while he trudged along in his regular sneakers because we didn't expect it to rain, and his feet were soaked. He was so mad. Now, Vessi does have an incredible early Black Friday offer right now, so use my link to grab yourself a pair for the winter months while they still have sizes, and you can thank me later. But if you do miss the Black Friday sale, we still have something for you. You can use my code Stephanie to get $25 off your Vessi shoes. So far, I have two pairs of Vessi shoes. I can't wait to get more in every color. I love them. I need a black pair, too, because black goes with everything. And, like, I know, they look big, okay? I get it. They look like big shoes. My feet are big, all right? Before anybody in the comments talks about how my feet are big, my feet are big. I'm only 5'4". I used to have small, dainty feet. But did you know, fun fact, every time you get pregnant, your feet grow, like, half a size. But I think my feet grew, like, a full shoe size every time I got pregnant. So I started off at, like, a cool 7, 7 and a half, And now, you know, here I am at a 9. But that's okay because having big feet means you have a big heart. That's what I heard. And I'm going with it. Let's jump right into the video. Okay, the first case we're going to talk about happened just uh, this month, November, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and said, since it's so new and developing, we don't have as much information as we do uh, in the second case, but I'll do my best to piece it together for you. 26-year-old Amanda Sharp Jefferson lived in an apartment near Desert Road and Maryland Parkway with her two daughters, one-year-old Rose and two-month-old Lily, and their father, Jaquan Singleton. Now, on November 5th, 2020, Jaquan left the apartment at around 7 p.m. to go visit with his older daughter, who was six years old, and her name is Violet. And Violet allegedly lived with Jaquan's mother. There's very little out there about this older child which is understandable and there shouldn't be that much about her because she's six years old she's a minor and we shouldn't be putting her public information out there but it is unknown whether Violet shared the same mother as Rose and Lily. Now, Jaquan said that when he left, everything seemed fine. Amanda was acting normally, and he gave his baby daughters hugs and kisses, promising to see them the next day. Hi, baby. We had them 11 months apart because we wanted them to be close and just grow together. Rose was my big juice, and uh, Lily was my brown sugar. Jaquan Singleton told me he left them with their mom, Amanda Sharp Jefferson, Thursday night, so he could be with his other daughter, Violet, at his grandmother's. I see Rose, I see uh, Amanda, I see Lily. Everything's good. I was like around seven something. I'm giving them kisses. I give them hugs. I'm like, I'll see y'all tomorrow. That was the last time he saw his two youngest daughters alive. The next morning when he returned home, once again, at first, everything seemed normal, except for the fact that his two daughters were asleep in a baby swing in the living room, which ordinarily would have been fine. But the way they were placed, almost stacked on top of each other, was strange when he got back to the apartment around noon on friday i see rose and lily like over there he said they were in the living room laying down rose was on top of lily amanda was home take this coat off put it on my bed and stuff and i'm like but as i'm doing that she's like shh, shh, shh. he said he thought they were asleep Jaquan took off his coat and he asked their mother and his girlfriend, Amanda, you know, why are they sleeping like this? Why are they positioned like this? But she just kept shushing him, saying like, shh, shh, be quiet, you know, and he assumed they were napping and she didn't want him to wake them up. At some point, he walked over to the babies and he touched Lily's face, finding her to be cold. At this point, he realized his children were not sleeping. They were no longer breathing. Until Phil Lily's head, I'm like, oh, she's kind of cold. After a few minutes of trying to get a response, it clicked, and he confronted Amanda. I'm asking, like, what did you do to my daughter? What did you do to my daughter? And she's like, shh, shh. Jaquan said he called his mom, then called 911. He said Amanda never did. She's super calm, cool, and collective about it, literally putting her clothes on, nothing, talking about can we sell the organs and stuff. He told me he thinks the girls were drowned. That day when I seen them, I died. I still feel dead. 
According to Jae Kwan, he demanded to know what Amanda had done to his children before calling his mother and then calling 911, which happened at around 12.15 in the afternoon. And he told the operator, quote, she drowned them. I feel like their mother drowned them or something, end quote. Now, according to Jae Kwan, after this happened and before the police arrived on the scene, Amanda was very calm, cool, and collected. And she began getting dressed, telling Jae Kwan that he shouldn't worry because the children's organs would be worth a lot of money. Paramedics who arrived on the scene shortly after also heard Amanda discussing how much her daughter's body parts would be worth if they were sold. And apparently, when she was later asked by police what she meant by these comments, she responded that she had seen it in a movie once where people made money on body parts after another person died. Now, this is absolutely horrible. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, did this come out of nowhere? According to Jay Kwan, Amanda had been acting completely normal up until a few weeks before the children's deaths. And that's when she'd started to believe that she was in some alternate spirit world. And she actually accused Jay Kwan of having an affair with a spirit wife. I was not too familiar with this whole spirit spouse idea, so I did some research. And I have to confess, as hard as these videos are to create most of the time because of the subject matter, what I do deeply appreciate is how much I learn while researching them. I'm so interested in other cultures and religions, and although I might personally feel certain aspects of these cultures and religions are unusual, I still respect them, and I'm open-minded while examining them because, of course, it's going to feel unusual to me. I'm just a visitor in this world. But when I first heard the term spirit wife in this case, I thought this is a rare thing. You know, this probably isn't something that's very commonplace. And since I do believe Amanda was suffering from postpartum depression, considering what she ended up doing and also taking into consideration how young little Rose was, just two months old, I felt maybe the spirit wife idea had stemmed from that. But this is actually pretty widely accepted. There are a lot, a lot of videos on YouTube with titles such as signs of a spirit wife or spirit husband in your life and overcoming spirit spouses. So I dug a little bit deeper to get to the bottom of where this came from, this concept, and what it meant. Now, it looks as if this is a Christian belief most widely seen in the Nigerian community, according to Pulse.ng. And the author of this article called Five Things You Know About Spirit Husbands and Wives writes, quote, To some, these kind of spouses are mere myths. To a lot of people in the church, they are definitely real. According to Christian Truth Center, they are demons, which explains why they can't be seen with normal eyes, end quote. Another website called TCH Africa Edition explains the belief that when your marriage is breaking up due to a husband or a wife who seems to have lost interest in you or as a woman you have serious gynecological problems, it's because you have a spirit husband who's basically trying to cause problems for you or a spirit wife. You know, this could go either way. I just want to make that clear. It's not specifically that there's only spirit wives or only spirit husbands. There's spirit spouses. These spirit spouses will cause sexual immorality in you by making love to you in your dreams and also forcing you to sleep with others outside your marriage. They can cause you to be disrespectful to your current spouse and incite arguments. They can even cause infertility. So Amanda apparently felt that Jay Kwan was in the grasp of one of these demon spirits who was trying to drive him away from her. And it's understandable that if you truly believe this, it might cause some emotional and mental distress. Amanda would later tell the police that she was single. She didn't even know who Jay Kwan was. He didn't live with her. And in fact, she lived alone in her apartment. She swore she had no children. She allegedly told police officers that she woke up that morning on November 6th and she saw children's toys and clothes in her apartment, which confused her because, like I said, she claimed she thought she didn't have any children. Then she went into the living room where she saw her two daughters, who she didn't know were her daughters, laying dead in the baby swing. And she felt that she had been set up. She felt that someone had come in, planted all of this baby stuff in her apartment, as well as the bodies of two children who she had never seen before, in an attempt to frame her for their murders. But Amanda did not call the police when she discovered this. She went and took a shower 
When asked why she took a shower instead of calling the authorities, she claimed it was because she really likes showers. This is a tough one to call for me. You all know, if you've watched really any of my previous videos, that people who hurt children receive little or no sympathy from me. It's sort of like my one constant. But I feel in this situation, something is clearly not right with this woman, Amanda. I don't think she's completely mentally healthy, and I do think there were warning signs. It's very hard to be a mother or a parent in general, let's be honest, and especially with two young babies so close in age. Jaquan told a reporter that they'd made the decision to have the two girls so close together so that their daughters would grow up close in age, be able to play together, be good friends. Jaquan also says that he has to forgive Amanda or he won't be able to move on with his life and he feels this is the best way he knows to honor his daughters by standing next to and supporting their mother on the long path ahead she's facing. She was going through a spiritual like uh, a spiritual and soul type of thing uh, where she thought she wasn't in this reality. She was in the spiritual and soul reality. He said the spiritual side all started a few weeks ago. I feel like maybe me not coming back that night got to her. Despite what his wife is accused of. I forgive her. I love her. I have to act like they're still here because the only way I can carry on their legacy is just like, you know, just stay positive. He told me he, Amanda, Rose, and Lily went everywhere together. If I walk around with hate, anger, hatred, I'm not going to be able to get through this situation. Now he walks alone without his big juice or brown Hi, sugar. <laughs> Life would never be the same. Obviously, there's going to be differences in this case, in the next one we're going to talk about. In one of these differences, if it turns out to be accurate, is that Amanda did not seem to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Apparently, law enforcement alluded to the fact that there may have been marijuana in the apartment, but cannabis doesn't make you go crazy or kill anyone. It just doesn't. You can't convince me it does. So as long as it's verified that Amanda truly had no drugs or alcohol in her system, it leaves us with the explanation that this may have been due to postpartum depression, which is so very common but hardly ever talked about. As mothers, we're taught and told that we need to always put ourselves last and that any sign of weakness means we just need to get better at functioning with no sleep and slowly losing our minds. After childbirth, many things happen that make a new mother feel like the floor has dropped out from under her. Firstly, there's a dramatic drop in hormones that were produced at high levels during pregnancy, specifically estrogen and progesterone. So physically, your body's going through all of these changes and it happens very quickly. Emotionally, although we are supposed to feel nothing but joy and gratitude after the birth of a child, our lives have completely changed, even if it's not your first child. We're most often sleep deprived and overwhelmed. There's not a spare moment for yourself because there's this little person who needs constant attention and care. Any semblance of a schedule or a routine you once had is completely shot. You walk around all day with baby puke on you, wearing the same clothes for a week straight, not remembering the last time you took a shower. Your sense of self is in jeopardy. Maybe you used to put on makeup and meet friends for coffee, but you can't do that anymore. You don't even have the energy to put on lipstick. And if you do have a spare moment, all you want to do is sleep or stare blankly at a wall, not socialize with friends. I'm going to be honest with you now because I have experienced this myself. Most of us who have had children do. I remember the feeling of just being pushed along by the tidal wave that my life had become, having no control or say in when I woke up, when I went to sleep, when I ate. I couldn't even drink coffee because I was nursing. I couldn't drink wine because I was nursing. And one night, my husband told me, you know, he thought I had postpartum depression. And I sobbed because to hear those words said to me made me feel so ashamed, so inadequate. And this is how most people feel when they hear those words. They think that something is wrong with them because they're not supposed to be sad after they have a baby. They're not supposed to feel completely disconnected from everything around them. But truly and honestly, there is nothing to be ashamed of. It is out of our control and it can be easily helped and addressed. But so many women never seek help because there is such a negative stigma attached to it. 
There are three categories to this. The first is the baby blues, and a large majority of women go through this after giving birth. It's characterized by symptoms such as mood swings, anxiety, crying spells, irritability, feeling overwhelmed, reduced concentration. Usually once the baby gets a bit older and your hormones have regulated themselves and some order is restored to your life, it will go away. Then there is postpartum depression, which is less common but still happens to many people. This is a more severe and long-lasting depression characterized by constant exhaustion and a loss of energy, a lack of interest and pleasure in things you used to enjoy, intense irritability and anger, hopelessness, thoughts of how you aren't a good mother, feelings of worthlessness, shame and inadequacy, and thoughts of harming yourself or your baby. And lastly, there is postpartum psychosis, which based on the symptoms, I feel it's very possible Amanda might have been struggling with. If you are dealing with postpartum psychosis, you will feel confused and disoriented. You may experience hallucinations and delusions, excessive energy and agitation, and you may make one or multiple attempts to harm yourself or your baby. If it's true that Amanda did not believe she even had children, and upon seeing the lifeless bodies of her daughters, her first thought was someone was trying to frame her, and her second thought was that she should take a shower, it's very possible Amanda Sharp Jefferson was suffering from postpartum psychosis. I'm not saying she was. I'm not saying that's the only option. She could be lying about everything. But it is possible that she was suffering from postpartum depression or psychosis. Now, Jaquan did give, um, I think, one or two interviews to reporters. And after seeing the interview with Jaquan, many people speculated that he seemed too calm and not upset at all. We have talked about this in many other videos. It's not really our job to dictate how others mourn or to judge them if they don't behave in the way we think they should or the way that we think we would in a similar situation. In this case, though, I did also find myself a bit taken aback by how accepting he seemed of the whole thing, how soon he had come to peace with all of it. But I don't know his background. He could be very spiritual. He could be really religious. He could just be a laid back guy to begin with. He could also be in denial because I can't imagine how absolutely soul crushing this would be. And Sometimes for self-preservation so that you don't absolutely crumble into a pile on the floor, you have to compartmentalize to protect yourself. And Jaquan still has a six-year-old daughter that he probably needs to be strong for. If he knows more than what he's saying or he was involved in any way, an investigation will most likely uncover that. But until that time, let's just try to remember that this man has just lost his two little baby girls and treat him with compassion and respect. And I am surprised to hear myself say this, knowing my track record for hating on these types of people. But we should also have compassion for Amanda. I truly believe once she gets the help she needs and realizes what she's done, living with this knowledge of what she did for the rest of her life will be a never ending story of heartbreak and sadness and she will need a lot of support. I'm gonna keep an eye on her case and see what happens. She's currently being charged with two counts of murder and her trial date has not been scheduled as of recording this video. Additionally, the Clark County Coroner's Office has not released the official cause of death for Little Rose and Lily Singleton as of yet. So I will update you when we have more which brings us to our next case, which is even more horrific, if you can believe that. 22-year-old Rachel Henry was originally from a small town in Oklahoma called Prague. She went to high school, worked at Walmart, and met her boyfriend, who was a man named Pedro Rios. And he would go on to be the father of their three children. About Rachel Henry, Pedro Rios told NBC News 12, quote, She's smart. She's a smart girl. We didn't plan for kids. They happened, and we just been together ever since, end quote. Those in her hometown of Prague had nothing but nice things to say about this young woman who, when she wasn't working, was caring for her sick mother. A co-worker of Rachel's said, quote, She had to be her caretaker. She did all her shopping for her, worked to pay the bills. Rachel had to do everything for her, end quote. Sadly, Rachel's mother passed in March of 2018, at which point Rachel and Pedro moved from Oklahoma 
to Maricopa County in Arizona. But even before they left Prague, it seemed that their lives were not perfect. There were at least four police reports filed, and most of them involved or mentioned Pedro Rios. During a July 2018 call, a Department of Human Services employee conducted a welfare check on Rachel's children and was told by Rachel that she was in the process of separating from her boyfriend, Pedro. But when another welfare check was done a month later, they discovered that Rachel and Pedro were still together, still living together, which apparently went against the safety plan Rachel had given the Department of Human Services. And apparently her keeping custody of her children was contingent on this plan. So the kids were removed from her care and placed with Pedro's mother for seven days before being returned home. Once in Phoenix, Rachel lived with her boyfriend, Pedro, their three children, which included a son, three-year-old Zane, and two daughters, one-year-old Mariah and six-month-old Catalea, as well as Pedro's aunt, a woman named Pearl Rebelato. Now, on a day in January 2020, Pedro and his aunt were both apparently out of the home, and Rachel was left alone with her three children, who she claimed she was going to put down for a nap around 2 p.m. Here's what happened next. According to Rachel, she and the kids were playing a game that she called Dog Pile on the living room couch. While playing with her one-year-old daughter, Mariah, Rachel claimed she could feel the child struggling to breathe. So for some reason, she placed her hands over the little girl's mouth and nose, cutting off the baby's airway. Three-year-old Zane attempted to stop his mother, yelling at her and even kicking her at one point. But Rachel continued preventing her child from breathing and claimed she knew Mariah was gone when her little legs stopped kicking. Next, Rachel turned her attention to three-year-old Zane and began chasing him around trying to catch him. But at this point, Pedro and his aunt got back home. So Rachel put Mariah's body in a back bedroom. And then she told Pedro and his aunt, Pearl, that she needed to change Zane. And she brought him into this bedroom as well. While Pedro and his aunt sat in the living room talking, watching TV, whatever, Rachel pinned her three-year-old son on the ground. She straddled him and attempted to stop him from breathing by using her body weight. When this didn't work, she covered his nose and mouth with her hands, and she sang a lullaby to him as he scratched at her chest and tried to get air into his lungs. After this was done, Rachel went to go get six-month-old Catalea. She fed the baby and then brought her into the same room that the other two children were in at that point, Rachel then sang her baby daughter to sleep, and when the little girl was slumbering peacefully, Rachel placed her hands over the baby's mouth and nose. When all three of her children were dead, Rachel brought them out, one by one, into the living room and laid them on the floor, telling Pedro and his aunt that they were sleeping. Timeline is a little vague on when this happened or when Pedro and his aunt realized that the babies were not actually sleeping, but around 7.20 p.m., an unidentified woman called 911, and when paramedics arrived, they found the children unresponsive. Rachel was arrested and charged with the murder of her three children, but apparently she initially gave no reason of why she had done this. It seems that Rachel had a history of drug abuse, meth to be specific. Pedro's Aunt Pearl claimed that she knew Rachel had been addicted to meth and also that Rachel had been acting strangely in the days prior to the murders. But during a video call with Pearl after Rachel was arrested, Rachel claimed that she'd been trying to tell people. She'd been going crazy for months and no one had listened. I'm going to play some of that call for you now. Hello? Hi. Rachel, why did you do that? What happened? I didn't know I didn't know what was going on. I told you I felt like I was losing my mind because I didn't understand what you guys were like. Why everyone was acting the way they were? I didn't. I mean, I, I was on drugs. And I was freaking out. I was freaking out. And I didn't know what to do, and I know I was scared. Why didn't you say something, Rachel? Because I tried to, and you guys kept telling me that I was crazy, and I didn't know what I was talking about. I, stupid and I was crazy and I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody. Rachel? Rachel? You don't understand. Rachel, we, we were getting your ID. 
You were getting your ID to go to work. I was trying to help you. I didn't. I was trying to get you happy and take you to work. Take you to get your yeah, ID. Yeah, but so it was the working. fact that I was always freaked out because I mean, everyone kept acting weird whenever I tried to t you know talk to anybody. They said I was acting stupid and I was acting crazy and I didn't know what I was talking about this and that and the other. And they didn't know what was going on. Oh my God. <sighs> I don't, Rachel. No, who could who could have fathomed that that that, Rachel? I don't I don't understand. Not, how you say you felt confused? That's how I feel now. I don't understand. How did you do this? I mean I mean okay. One thing is that you need to go to sleep or or your whatever whatever you're going. Through. I understand. Okay, maybe I, I maybe we didn't pay enough attention to you. I don't know. I don't know. I I can't understand this. I can't fathom what you said. I can't, I can't, I can't understand. I can't, I can't understand it. I can't, it just don't pass through my mind and I don't care about stuff or, or, or bad I'm feeling or whatever that does not pass through my mind. And what you did would never pass through my mind. I've never expected you to do something like that, Rachel. What? I don't know, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was never doing it because me, I don't know, it wasn't me. That's the point I kept telling you that I didn't, I was, I felt like I was losing my mind. I didn't know what was going on. I tried to talk to somebody. They kept telling me I was stupid. I was crazy. I didn't know what I'm talking about. Rachel. And every time I tried to talk to somebody other than that, you kept saying that I was making it all about me. You're acting me weird. And you're acting weird. Oh, I did. Yeah, you're right. I do. I did. Rachel, That's I did. I tried to stop being like I, couldn't, I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody. Rachel. If you can go to the doctors to get birth control, why couldn't you go to the doctors to find somebody to talk to if we weren't paying attention? I because thought you were just. I, I could never. I couldn't even go to the store. You wouldn't even let me go to the store. Who wouldn't? You. Who wouldn't let you go to the store? Why wouldn't I let you go to the store? I couldn't even go outside. You could go outside, I Rachel. Want, you know how bad I wanted to go to the store. I wanted to go outside. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. You said I couldn't be seen by Francisco. You said I couldn't go to the store because all the babies, this and that. And I mean, I was trapped in a house. I felt like I was going crazy. Why didn't you because just leave? You said, because that one night that you said that if, if I tried to leave, that you were going to catch me halfway down the street. You grab me by my hair. You are going to bring me back and beat the hell out of me. Rachel, because you wanted to go out and can do drugs over at the park. That's why. I didn't want to go you out and do drugs at the park. You didn't say you were going to go to a psychiatrist or something. I'm not going to argue over this with you. I just wanted to, I just wanted to know why. So now it's our fault because we didn't pay attention to you going crazy. No, it's not. I think that you were going to kill your kid. But let me show. I let me tell you. I didn't want to do the point. So it wasn't I'm me. Sorry. When you're not right in your head, you don't understand. So there's going to be a little less empathy from me on this one. I will summarize the call in case you couldn't understand everything that was said. But basically, Pearl asks Rachel, why did you do this? And Rachel responds that she didn't know what was going on, that she felt like she was losing her mind and she was on drugs and freaking out. She didn't know what to do and she was scared. When Pearl asked, you know, why didn't Rachel say something, Rachel responds and says, I tried. I tried, but everyone kept telling me that I was crazy or stupid or I didn't know what I was talking about. She also mentions that Pearl at one point told her, you know, you're trying to make this all about yourself. This isn't about you. You've got kids. Stop being so selfish. And when Pearl asks why Rachel could go to the doctors to get birth control but not mention to the doctor the way she was feeling so that she could get help, Rachel accuses Pearl of essentially not even allowing her to go anywhere, not even to the store. At one point, she says, quote, You said I couldn't be seen by Francisco. You said I couldn't go to the store because of all the babies. I was trapped in the house. I felt like I was going crazy, end quote. Um, I don't know who Francisco is. That part of the story isn't clear. I tried to find it, but I couldn't. I, I can only assume it's somebody that Pearl didn't want Rachel to see. And I just, I, I guess it blows my mind that um, it took until after 7 that evening for someone to call the police. Because if you think about it, Rachel was supposed to put the kids down for a nap around 2. 
And I think the reason Pearl and Pedro were not in the apartment was because Pedro had been at work and then Pearl had left to go pick him up. Once again, I'm not sure the exact timeline. But if Rachel was supposed to put the kids down for a nap around 2, I'd assume that she told Pedro and his Aunt Pearl, probably somewhere between 2 and 4, that they were sleeping. And how they were left there sleeping like that for so many hours until 911 was called, I don't understand. Because if my kids sleep for any longer than they're supposed to, I'm just a crazy person like that. I'll go in and make sure they're still breathing. You know, like Bella wakes up early. So if she sleeps past 730, I'm in her room like looking at her, like putting a mirror up to her nose, you know, to make sure she's still breathing um, because I'm constantly worried about that. But the reason I have a little bit less empathy for Rachel is because unlike Amanda, Rachel wasn't seeing things. She wasn't confused about her identity. She wasn't confused as to whose children were in her house. And she systematically went through each of those babies and smothered them. Her excuse being pretty much that she wanted to go outside or go to the store and she felt trapped, which is an understandable feeling when you have small children. I completely get that. But still. Additionally, in this call, she admits that she was on drugs, which I imagine was a huge contributing factor, especially when we're talking about meth. Also, I did get a feeling that there's a huge lack of accountability here. I did this because you all said I was crazy. I did this because I felt trapped. And these are, like I said, completely normal emotions to feel when you have young children. But most people don't solve this problem by killing their young children. However, I will say, in my humble opinion, and it's just my opinion, allegedly don't come from me, the true blame doesn't fall completely on Rachel. The phone call makes it clear to me that she did express to others the way she was feeling, and they dismissed her. They made her feel as if she just needed to suck it up and stop being selfish. The red flags were there. The warning signs were there. And Rachel should have been seeing someone. She should have gotten help, and she probably should not have been left alone with those kids until she got help. Michelle Oberman, a professor at the Santa Clara University for Law, has written two books on the subject of filicide. And she said, quote, There's a pattern to these cases, patterned to the point that when looking back at what happened, there's a sense of inevitability that the harm was going to come, and it was just a matter of when and what was going to happen, end quote. Oberman says that women who commit filicide are often isolated in their motherhood. They may be alone for hours and hours without any adult to talk to. Add to this the fact that Rachel had just recently lost her mother and had just recently moved to a new place where she didn't know anyone, she didn't have a job or money of her own, it may have left her feeling very sad, very lonely, and very desperate. Michelle Oberman also says, quote, Who would think it's a good idea for a 22-year-old that's new in town with a drug habit to be on her own with three kids all under the age of four? That's her job, and it's really hard, but she's not trained for it. No one is trained for that, end quote. Oberman followed this up by saying, quote, What I've learned over time is there's blood on more than one hand. There's usually more folks who knew and turned a blind eye to the idea that there was a struggle there. It's amazing to me how many warning signs there were and how hard people worked to look the other way, end quote. So taking all of this in, and I know it's a lot and it's hard, um, what what good can come of this? Because sometimes you, you have to find the sun in in a cloudy sky. I'm lucky enough to have a platform where I can talk to people and I'm lucky enough to have such an amazing audience. An audience I know is compassionate and kind and wants the best for everyone and would truly and genuinely like to go out into the world and, and put goodness into the world. I know you guys are like that. I see you. I read your comments. I talk with you. I know who you are. So with all of this, how can we help others in our lives? Right now as we speak, I'm sure we all know at least one new mother. I'm sure many of you watching this right now are new mothers yourselves because like I said, I see your comments. I see you struggling. I see how tired you are and how you look forward to putting the kids down for a nap so you can sip your coffee and watch my videos. And I have to say, that is the first step. Maybe not watching my videos. I'm not trying to be narcissistic here. Like the first step is to watch my videos. But what I mean is taking time for yourself. Because even though you are a mother, that's certainly not all you are. In the description box, you will find some resources, numbers you can call to seek help. Knowledge is power. And sometimes just knowing there's people you can talk to if you need 
It can make a big impact. Any of us in this community would be happy to talk to you as well if you feel like you're struggling and you need a friend. I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I think I can. And don't be afraid to ask for help from those around you. No one should judge you for that. Tell your husband or your mother or your mother-in-law that you'd really just like to take a long hot shower alone and drink a cup of coffee that's fresh and hot, not microwaved four times before you even get your first sip. Don't downplay the way you're feeling. Be honest with yourself and your loved ones and say, I need help. I'm not feeling great mentally and I feel like I've reached a point where I need a little break to remember who I am. And as the friend or family member of someone who's suffering with the baby blues or full postpartum depression, there's plenty that you can do as well. Check in with your friend or family member often. She may want to isolate herself. I can tell you she probably will. She may ignore your calls or turn you down whenever you ask if she needs help. But I promise if you show up at her house with a pot full of something she didn't have to cook and an offer to watch the baby so she can take a nap for an hour, she will not say no. She won't, she won't say no, I promise. And find activities that, that she can do with you or friends and with the baby. Get her outside for a walk. Hand her a latte. Let the baby sleep while the two of you walk and talk about anything, but not about baby stuff, if it can be helped. Talk about a show the two of you both love. Talk about a movie you just watched. Talk about your crazy coworker. Make her laugh. Make her feel human again. And cheer her on every chance you can get. Text or call and say you saw the new picture she posted on Facebook and tell her that she's doing such a good job with the hard task of parenting full time. Or even parenting part time is a hard task, right? Remind her that although she's so important to her child, she's also important to you and others and you're proud of her because it's not easy. Don't do any of this motherhood is the greatest joy in all of the land BS, right? Say the quiet thing out loud. Motherhood is a blessing, but it's hard and grueling, and most times it's thankless, and you can feel like you're completely alone in the world. Tell your friend or your family member that she deserves a trophy for getting up and doing it every day, because let's be honest, she does. Real impactful change does not happen on a huge level. It happens person to person, and sometimes these people just need to know that someone hears them and someone cares. So like I said, there are resources in the description box if you or someone you know is dealing with postpartum depression. And I will repeat once again, we are here for you in this community if you need us. You guys can email me if you wanna keep it private. You can post in the comments if you feel like opening up and sharing with us the way you're feeling. And there are going to be tons of people who are gonna be there to tell you that everything's gonna be okay and that you're doing a great job. And that's all you need to hear sometimes. It's really literally all you need to hear sometimes. And if you do feel like you need help, there are resources. And you can also go to your doctor. Just say the quiet thing out loud. Say you need help and say you're not doing well. There's no shame in it. You should never be embarrassed for that. Thank you guys so much for joining me for this video. I know it was a little tough, but... Um, that's life, right? Them's the breaks. This is this happens in the world. This stuff happens and it's better to talk about it and raise awareness so that we can maybe prevent it from happening again. Thank you guys so much for being here. Remember to like the video if you liked it. Remember to share it if you think it's worth sharing. And remember to subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And if you already did subscribe, make sure you still are because YouTube likes to unsubscribe people from my channel. Check out Vessi in the description box. I really think that they would make great Christmas gifts as well. So that's kind of, you know, a season that's coming up. Christmas season is, is quickly and rapidly approaching. And um, I think that they would make great Christmas gifts for anyone, especially during the winter season if you live someplace where it's snowy or rainy. Don't forget to follow me on social media. Tags are in the description box. And don't forget to leave a comment and let me know what you think. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and I will see you very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood